I'm stuck in the same thing. It makes me go to open web. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, What Do Science and Data Say About the Near-Term Future of Singing? I'm Alan Henderson, Executive Director of the National Association of Teachers of Singing, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Tim Sharp, the Executive Director of ACDA, uh, Catherine Dahoney, CEO of Chorus America, and Marty Monson, CEO of the Barbershop Harmony Society. 
The staff and leadership of our organizations are concerned about the challenges we face as a singing community. Uh, first, a few housekeeping items in order for, to help us manage this uh, large crowd of attendees, we ask you to help us. Uh, you'll find a, uh, on your control panel area uh, an area where you can ask questions. Please uh, wait to submit questions until we're probably at least 30 minutes into the session. We hope to answer many of your questions uh, in some of our presentations, uh, and that will help us kind of manage the question area if we don't have a lot of repeated questions. And also, please do not enter any greetings or other messages to panelists and guests, questions only. Our conversation today is in three segments. The first hour will consist of conversation with our medical and scientific experts, Drs. Milton and Halstead. Uh, we will then move to discuss for a few moments what research tells us about the attitudes of audiences and others who attend our worship services, solo recitals, and choral events, and when they are likely to feel comfortable returning to our performances. We'll also discuss some of the work that is happening regarding phased re-engagement as we long to return to gathering together as singers and performers. In our final segment, we'll discuss many of the questions we as singers, directors, artistic directors, board members, voice coaches, and others need to ask ourselves as we contemplate and plan for an eventual return to face-to-face -face rehearsal and lessons. Uh, within two hours of the conclusion of this webinar, a recording will be available for viewing uh, and sharing by the many individuals who are unable to subscribe to the live version of this discussion due to the maximum capacity of the live event being met. You can find that on the official Nats YouTube channel, uh, which is www.youtube.com backslash official Nats. I also direct you to regularly check the COVID-19 pages on the websites of each of our organizations, where we are all trying to keep you informed of important information and resources and where we will all post a link to the recording of this event. Uh, we are also grateful to Deanna McBroom, who's a retired professor at the College of Charleston and who is uh, also engaged with athletes and the arts and also the Performing Arts Medical Association who uh, prepared a, a handout for us, which you should be able to download. It will also be posted along with the recordings that uh, we post. We also want to better understand our audience tonight, so we're uh, going to have several polls we will conduct throughout this session, and they will appear on your screen, and we'll share the results as we move through this evening. Um, we are, we're very pleased to welcome our distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Donald Milton and Dr. Lucinda Halstead. Uh, Dr. Milton is Professor of Environmental Health at the University of Maryland School of Public Health with a joint appointment in the medical school where he is a leading researcher whose work focuses uh, on the interrelated areas of infectious bioaerosols, exhale breath analysis, and the development and application of innovative methods of, uh, for respiratory epidemiology. Dr. Lucinda Halstead is an otolaryngologist and medical director of the Evelyn Trammell Institute for Voice and Swallowing at the Medical Co University of South Carolina. She's also president-elect of the Performing Arts Medicine Association and a laryngologist for the Spoleto Festival. Uh, we've been having a slight technical difficulty with Dr. Uh, Milton's camera, uh, but we do have him on audio and we're still working on that uh, technical difficulty. So hopefully that will uh, appear before too long. But we're going to dive right in uh, with Dr. Halstead and Dr. Milton, and we want to welcome you uh, both to our event tonight. And we just want to dive in uh, really quickly with uh, just a, a question about what does medical science tell us about the aerosolization of viruses, particularly ones like COVID-19 and how the virus is spread 
uh, and how that might relate to decisions we might make as, uh, as a singing community. Uh, Dr. Milton? Hi. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, adding the sixth uh, different video conferencing system to my computer doesn't seem to like it. Um, it prefers Zoom for some reason. Um, but uh, so I hope that my slides arrive and you get to see them on the screen in a moment. Uh, I've emailed them over to uh, Alan um, and um, I, I hope you get to, to look at them. So um, we're starting off talking about transmission perspective and, and how this is gonna impact the future. So this virus now has only been around for five months now, I guess. Um, and we're still learning a lot about it. Uh, as you know, it originated in Wuhan and um, uh, appears to have moved from an animal reservoir into humans uh, and then began spreading rapidly in the human population because nobody has been exposed to it before. We don't have any immunity and hence we are all susceptible. Um, early on, uh, it became clear that um, there was some amount of asymptomatic transmission. Um, uh, the in initial uh, uh, case was uh, where this was reported was in the New England Journal early in the year. And uh, we go to the next slide. Um, it appeared that the uh, this is a little bit of animation. So if we move to the next slide, um, I don't know if I can do, can I do this? No. Uh, and um, it, it appeared that someone was asymptomatic, came to a business meeting in Germany and infected two other people. It later turned out that she had had some symptoms while she was there, but um, uh, even though she was symptomatic when uh, she infected others, patient one in Germany wasn't symptomatic for several days. And yet during the time he was uh, asymptomatic, he infected two other people. Uh, you may have seen an article in Science arguing that, well, this first person from Shanghai was not asymptomatic. But patient one in Germany was clearly asymptomatic when he infected patients three and four. And since then, we've seen a lot of evidence that asymptomatic persons are contagious. And in fact, the recent paper has suggested that perhaps the peak of contagiousness occurs just before the symptom onset. This is very different than what we had in SARS back in 2003, where people were very, very uh, contagious late in the course of their illness and early on seldom transmitted to anybody before they had symptoms. That made it much easier thing to control than what we're dealing with today. So how do we transmit respiratory infections? So the, the uh, thinking is that there are really uh, several different ways that we can do it. One is through large ballistic droplets and you can get a direct hit and they can, you might be able to inhale them into your upper respiratory tract. Uh, if it's a coarse aerosol, you can breathe it in. And if it's a fine aerosol, it can float around on the air streams and you can inhale it. And some people would argue that the coarse aerosol is not airborne, but it's still floating in the air and you're still sucking it in with your breath, uh, as you are also doing with the fine aerosol. Um, ballistic droplets are not gonna travel more than a few feet usually, but there's been recent work showing that if you have a powerful sneeze, you can have a plume that can travel many feet. So, where there's really two ways of talking about droplets and particles that can carry respiratory viruses. One is our standard medical categories, which we talk about, and you'll hear frequently people talking about respiratory droplets. Um, and um, what just happened? 
Uh, ah. Share your screen and it'll share your uh, PowerPoint with us. Um, so it's making me re Let's see, is that working now? Just waiting to view it. Are you seeing this? We're not seeing your uh, screen at this point. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Were you seeing something before? Alan? No, they can't not. Slides. Say that again, please. Um, were, were you seeing, uh, were you showing the slides earlier? No, I was not because I, I did not get them. The they, yeah, they can't see the slides. I just got an email about that. Um, you can, it should allow you to choose your, to show your slides. Apologize for that. Um, where is it loud? Get, showing that i don't see uh, the control panel under sharing should say allow you to show your screen um i see a control panel and there's audio and there's webcam handouts and chat um We can make sure we add everyone uh, the PowerPoint to the recording as well so people can view it. We can just continue with our conversation and okay. we'll, we'll so come back to that. we could talk about yeah, it's unfortunate because I have a few graphs in the slides that would be really helpful for people to see. Um, and um the, the the medical categories talk often about respiratory droplets, which seem is defined as vaguely as droplets droplets that don't travel very far, and the mode of inoculation by respiratory droplets is unclear, but generally thought maybe to not be inhaled, probably more contamination of uh, of surfaces, and then self inoculation. So. If you get it on your face and you rub your face and put it in your eyes or nose, um, and and uh, not considered airborne transmission, and then aerosols or droplet nuclei, which are generally thought to be less than five microns in diameter and small enough to travel long distances, and considered the only cause of airborne infection, and usually thought of as being that you have to see it happen at long distances or it's not happening. Whereas the basis in exposure science and uh, pulmonary physiology, we talk about aerosols as being a wide range of particle sizes up to 50 to 100 microns in diameter, which some of which don't travel very far, others which can travel farther. Uh, and it turns out that it, inhaling through the nose and especially through the mouth, you can inhale droplets that are much larger than five microns. You can inhale droplets up to 100 microns. Think about pollen. Pollen tends to be quite large and can be inhaled and you get it stuck in the nose. And so the, the particles that are larger than about 20 microns mostly end up in the nose particles that are uh, a bit smaller, less than 15 or 20 microns, end up deeper and they get into the trachea and large airways, but don't go out beyond that. And then particles less than 10 microns and especially less than five microns can penetrate much more deeply into the lung. And so we talk about these as inhalable fraction 
the thoracic fraction or tracheal bronchial fraction and the respirable fa fraction. The, the respirable fraction being the very small stuff that can get way out deep into the airways. But when we think about the size of uh, the virus, the virus is so small that even a one micron particle could hold a thousand coronavirus particles. So um, you, you don't need a very large particle to hold a lot of virus payload. And even when you're talking about particles in the five micron size range, where they begin to penetrate significantly into the lower airways, most of them still end up in your nose if you're nose breathing. So it's, it's much more a continuum from lar very large things that don't get past much past your nostrils uh, or your mouth, if you're mouth breathing, to things that can deposit far out in the lung. And it may make a difference as to how ill you become, where it deposited, and how much dose you got. And it's very likely that with SARS-CoV-2 that you need a pretty large dose to have a real risk of infection and symptoms. Uh, I then have a slide uh, from a study by Asadi et al. looking at aerosol emissions and super emissions during human speech with voice loudness. And it shows that the louder one speaks, the more aerosol one generates. This study did not really distinguish where the aerosol was coming from, what was coming from the lower respiratory tract and what was coming from the upper respiratory tract, which may be important depending on how much in the viruses in each of these locations at the time that the aerosol is being emitted. But it's quite clear that uh, speech uh, and by extension singing can be a big source of aerosols, but there's not as much study has been done of aerosols. And I recently heard about, I got some emails from a colleague at the University of Colorado, who's working with uh, some colleagues at the University of Maryland and others to look at aerosol generation from wind instruments as well. Uh, but that is much less studied. Um, one of the things that has been a big interest in pulmonary physiology and pulmonary medicine for a long time is these aerosols coming from the deep lung, can we use them as a diagnostic? And so we've put some effort for the last 20 years into understanding how these aerosols are generated. Ironically, they were first noticed, in fact, at Los Alamos when they were doing respirator fit testing for nuclear workers. And they found that there were some workers that if they tested them, even a clean in a clean room where there was no particles in the air around them, and they, they had them wear a full face respirator and they sampled inside the respirator, there were some people who always had particles inside their respirator. And they eventually figured out that these particles were coming from them. And it turns out that everybody generates some particles during breathing even during quiet tidal breathing. But some people generate many times more than everybody else does. And it's a typical log normal distribution where you have 20% of the people account for 80% of all the particles that people generate. And it turns out that what's going on is that as you exhale, uh, it, you, if you, especially if you exhale all the way down to residual volume and really get all of the air out of your lungs, you collapse some small airways. And when you take a deep breath, you pop those airways open and there's a little fluid film that forms and breaks. And that film leaves a little droplet that you inhale into your alveolus. And on the next breath, you exhale it. And so I've taken even, young, healthy people who don't shed any particles during tidal breathing because they don't collapse airways during tidal breathing and had them exhale to residual volume and then up to TLC. Yeah. And on the next breath, they'll put out 10,000 times as many particles as they do normally. And there's some tendency as we get older to do 
have because we lose elasticity, so we tend to have more airway closure at higher lung volumes, and we generate more particles. So there's particle generation during norm, normal tidal breathing, and this is highly variable. So some people do a lot of it, other people don't do very much, and there may be in some infections more of this happening during the infection than normally because you now have more fluid in the airways and they close more easily. So we have this elusive pathway, the aerobiological pathway of transmission of communicable respiratory disease, which is the title of an article that Chad Roy and I wrote in the New England Journal in 2004 to accompany an article about the Amoy Gardens outbreak of SARS where 187 people were infected in one event uh, when somebody who was immunosuppressed went to visit his nephew. He was suffering from SARS, but didn't realize what he had, used the toilet and flushed it up on something like the 20th floor. And the soil stack, the, the feces fell 20 stories, creating an aerosol in the soil stack. Many people were not watering the floor drains in the bathroom, and the bathrooms all had exhaust fans that put them under negative pressure to the soil stack. And it pulled this fecal aerosol up into the homes and spread it through the apartment complex. And it traveled between buildings, but only to certain other buildings that were downwind of that. And the buildings that were not downwind didn't get infected at all. And a computational fluid dynamic multi-zone model of the air movement in these buildings modeled exactly where all the cases were. So we know this event, which was a, a very unusual circumstance, hopefully, Although I do remember when I was writing this uh, commentary about it, noticing that my office was ac across the hall from a daycare center and that uh, nobody was watering the floor drains in the office bathrooms. But uh, hopefully this is a rare occurrence and um, uh, you don't see explosive outbreaks like this. Um, but the particle sizes of the droplets that are generated depend on how they were generated. Are they generated from a sewage aerosol like that? Or are they generated by moving objects that have like flapping a blanket that has stuff on it? Or is it generated from the respiratory tract? And if they're generated like the airway closure and reopening, they're very small. They're only big enough to hold very few viral particles. Whereas if they are generated in the upper respiratory tract, as um, you would see if you could see the pictures, they tend to be larger and they're in the single to micron and up range. Um, a, and uh, they can be uh, increased by coughing and singing and talking and so forth. Then when they're in the air, their liquid droplets, their dynamic sizes, they dry out um, they may be exposed to sunlight, uh, and as they dry out and they concentrate, that may damage the virus so that it can't reproduce after it lands. Um, and uh, ultraviolet light might de cause decay of the virus. There's been a controversy lately about whether sunlight kills the virus, and I can tell you it does. There's a preprint from the National Biodefense Countermeasures Center that shows that it does. Um, and then when you inhale it, what happens to it? Where does it land? Well, it depends on what size it came, got to and how fast it rehydrates in your airways and where it's going to land and what's going to happen to it then. So uh, I've been doing studies now for 15 years to, uh, looking at exhaled breath of infected cases. We developed a device we call the Gazuntight 2 um, uh, back in, in uh, 2006, 7 that um, was designed to be able to test this question of if you put surgical masks on people who are sick, will it reduce how much virus they shed into the air? And indeed, we found that it does do something, but we also looked at 
how much virus people were shedding into the air when they didn't wear a mask and how much did coughing contribute. And what we found was is that people who just sat in the device for half an hour and didn't cough the entire time they were in there and recited the alphabet three times still could be detected to have shed infectious influenza virus that we could culture from their breath um, and it was in fine particles less than five microns in diameter. So uh, th that really answered this question. It wasn't just that there's like a signature from the nucleic acid present. There's real infectious virus in these particles. And as people coughed, people who were coughing were shedding more virus, but coughing wasn't necessary for shedding virus. And uh, then I have a slide uh, showing the computational fluid dynamic model of the Amway Gardens that was published in the New England Journal, and also a paper from Clinical Infectious Diseases published in 2016 of investigators who were air sampling in the hallway outside of a MERS patient room in South Korea and were able to culture the virus from the air outside of a room that was under negative pressure. So clearly people walking in and out the door were dragging aerosol out of the room and you were able, they were able to culture the air in uh, the virus from the air in the hallway. Um, and recently uh, there are some papers, there's a paper in Nature last week uh, showing that uh, the nucleic acid signature of the virus, although they didn't culture it in that paper, uh, was present in the air in even very small particle sizes down much less than one micron um, in the air in uh, hospitals in Wuhan. Uh, so we know it can get into the air. Um, we're not entirely sure how it gets there, but some of it's probably directly from the respiratory tract. And um, uh, then the question is, well, how long does it survive? And there was a paper in the New England Journal showing that uh, aerosolized by using a collison nebulizer, which is a real brutal way to air generate an aerosol. And it's kind of surprising the virus survives it, but it does. And most influenza viruses survive it too, but not all of them. Um, and But once it got into the air, it persisted in the air. Um, even though they were using a temperature and relative humidity conditions that are actually pretty unfavorable for the virus. Um, so we would expect, in fact, that if they had used uh, lower relative humidities or higher relative humidities, that it probably would have survived even better. Uh, so um, that was concerning. Um, and then there's a preprint from a group in Singapore that I've been consulting with um, using uh, uh, size selective samplers uh, in a high containment unit in Singapore. And they too have been able to show that the virus was present in one to four micron and larger than four micron aerosols in a room that was on, having 12 air changes per hour of ventilation. Uh, with directed flow from the ceiling across the bed and then out by the head of the bed and still we're able to pick it up in the room. So again, that's not very comforting. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then there's a paper from the University of Nebraska that's out in a preprint where uh, they were able to pick it up in the hallway, although it turns out the sampler in the hallway was placed on the floor. So I'm not sure how worried I am about that. Although the fact that they're picking it up in the hallway in the Nebraska containment unit, that's where we were treating Ebola cases, okay? It's a high containment unit, and that's a bit worrisome. Um, and even more worrisome is that the personal sampler that the person was wearing who was collect going in the room and setting up the samplers had a lot more virus on it than the area samplers did. So it clearly the personnel are at risk. and now, that said, in Nebraska, they have very good practices with personal protective equipment and respirators and the whole bit, and nobody working there has been infected. Uh, you have probably heard a lot about the restaurant outbreak that was published in the Emerging Infectious Diseases now a couple weeks ago, 
uh, and uh, I was interviewed for ABC uh, The World Tonight on Friday, uh, and they had a segment, and they had this picture that I have here from Hugo Lee's paper, uh, which is another paper about the same outbreak that has done a detailed engineering outbreak, including releasing tracer grasses and reproducing the conditions to really understand what was happening in the restaurant. And what it turns out is that there was no dilution ventilation in this restaurant. They had sealed up the exhaust vents. And so they had mini splits up on the ceiling that were just recirculating the air and the way it was set up, the back end of the restaurant away from the elevator and the entrance on this third floor dining room uh, was basically a dead zone. And they were just recirculating the air around the back end of the room. And so people at the other side of the room had much lower exposures. So there's been a lot of debate about uh, the authors of the EID paper said, well, this shows that it's large droplets, but as the host on the night on the ABC News said, you know, some of the people were 15 feet away, okay? So, you know, this is not like, so the authors are saying, well, it's large droplets and it's not aerosols, but a definition of an aerosol is a particle or a droplet that's following the air currents. Well, that's an aerosol by definition. Now, it's true that us aerobiologists over a couple of beers like to argue about whether a cow in a tornado is a bioaerosol. But <laughs> the point is that these are droplets that are still probably small enough that you can inhale them. So it could be that they settled out on people's dishes and they ate them, but it seems more likely to me that they inhaled them. Uh, it, but it, it may be that they were in the you know 20 micron and up particle size and that's why they didn't get that far down into the other part of the restaurant but it also may be a dose issue it's not clear to me that anybody went in and tested everybody else in the restaurant and we know that people who got lower exposures weren't asymptomatic infected there's just so as, you know, yeah. As we move into some of the studies that you've talked about, how do those? How can some of those inform us? Uh, you know, for about things like choral rehearsals or one-on-one -on -one voice lessons and and some of the activities that we specifically are engaged in. So I think that um, uh, so I have a slide down here about the Skagit outbreak in the choir uh, and and there on you know there was a rehearsal on March 10th after which a large proportion of the 55 people who attended became infected about 70 percent it appears and um, even though uh, the people knew that you know they didn't think there was SARS-2 uh, SARS in their neighborhood yet but they practice some amount of social distancing. They all used hand sanitizer and so forth. Um, but uh, it's clear that there was a lot of uh, transmission there. If it was by aerosols uh, and if they actually had about a half an air change per hour in the room, which some people have estimated based on talking to people involved, um, you can estimate that if you increase the ventilation in that room, you could have reduced the attack rate. If you got it up to nine or 10 air changes per hour from one, a half to one, you could have driven it down maybe to 14% attack rate if it was airborne, but it wouldn't have been zero. And so, um, although ventilation can make a difference, if you have uh, asymptomatic infected persons there, it's not going to drive it to zero. Um, you would need much more effective means of, uh, of removing it from the air. And that's where uh, things like upper room UV in practice rooms may play a role. Because um, uh, with pox viruses, which are exquisitely sensitive to UV, we've achieved this you know, 100 to 1,000 
air changes equivalents per hour. Uh, I've estimated recently uh, that you could probably get 20 to 60 air changes per hour equivalent cleaning of the air of coronaviruses because coronaviruses are only about 20% as sensitive to UV as, uh, as pox viruses. Um, uh, but uh, they, you, upper room UV could still, in places where you can't increase the ventilation or where you need very high rates of ventilation because you have a lot of people, uh, might be a, an added solution. Mm -hmm. And we discussed some of those systems in our pre-chat about this, where you can install upper room UV systems in rooms. Uh, probably for around $1,000 uh, an installation. Uh, but of course, then you have to have a, a fan system which circulates the air so that it can reach the UV. Uh, yeah, so you can use ceiling fans for that and they're quite effective. Yeah. How long does uh, aerosolized virus tend to last in the air? Well, the survival suggests that, you know, the half-life is on the order of, uh, well, one study I've seen says half an hour, but another says it's much longer than that. Um, and it, but, you know, if you have uh, an air change per hour, um, that means that the half-life just of the particles in the air is, is uh, less than an hour. So, um, you know, if you have uh, five air changes an hour, uh, you know, you're talking uh, six air changes an hour would give you a 10 minute uh, uh, air change. And that means it would be about seven minute half-life just of aerosols. So you can see that really by ventilation, you drive the half-life of down much faster than the biology drives it down by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's move and, and talk to Dr. Halstead and ask her, uh, you know, for some of her thoughts uh, about what we've heard from Dr. Milton and some of the things she has to add to our conversation. Sure. Um, yes. All right. So we're using my my slides off of my. Can people see my slides or not? I'm going to show them right now. Okay. Will I be able to see them as well? Uh, hopefully. Yay. Whoop. There we are. Okay. Um, well, I've really enjoyed getting to meet and know Dr. Milton a little bit. It's been an incredible experience. Uh, because I'm really a clinician um, and not a basic scientist. So I'm going to try to share some of the things that I think are important to take away from his, um, his you know, wonderful research and you know, how, can, how can we apply it every day? Um, are you advancing the slides, Alan? I can, yep. Okay, because I, I, I just tried it and it didn't, didn't work. Um, oops. Okay, so um, I think that the most important thing and the reason that we are here is that all of us are passionate about the voice and especially the singing voice. And we're here today because your souls are crying out to express themselves. And what we're going to hopefully do between Donald and I and all of your questions and all of the expertise we have here uh, is to try to see what we can do to keep things safe. I'm going to have just next slide, please. Okay. So Alan asked me, what does your visit to your laryngologist look like in the age of COVID-19? So here I am in my office before the pandemic. Next slide. This is what you're going to see when you come to my office. So we do um, rapid PCR uh, preliminary testing for the virus. And 
at our institution, we have a three to five percent false negative rate, which means that three to five percent of the people that we co that come in with a negative test are actually positive. Okay, so that's on the patient side. Now, as you can all see, I'm just an ingenue. No. So for my age group, which is in the 60s, um, I have about a 15% chance of dying of this virus if I get it. So what our infectious disease people have said, since I'm going to be in your airway, looking down into your throat, that I need to be protected. So I have um, glasses on, I have an eye shield with a special splash veil that I've designed. Um, I have an N95 mask. I have a droplet proof gown and I'll, obviously I'm wearing gloves. Okay. So I will tell you right now and some of my colleagues who really know me know that I'm almost never hot or warm. This is warm. In fact, most people would say it's hot. It's a very hot outfit, and we're going to go into some of that when we talk about, you know, what can you do when you're singing and what you can't do um, with that. Next slide, please. So, you know, Dr. Milton has gone into um, this in great detail, and he had actually shared with us on Sunday that there are many, many outbreaks, even some in South Korea that were very bad, that really started in churches where you have a large number of people who are singing loudly, they're exchanging uh, air, and we don't know what the ventilation is in many of these places. And I would just, again, then say, think about your practice rooms. Think about the college dormitories where, you know, the only ventilation you have is opening the window. Um, so there's, there's the aerosolation, but then there's also the transmission of viral particles off the surface, um, that you do need to be aware of because people are passing folders around, they're passing music around, they're touching, they're kissing, they're going to the bathroom, they're touching all the, the doors, um, all of those different things, uh, that you do need to be aware of simply because you're going to take your hands and without thinking about it, you're going to put them on your face. As a surgeon, we're trained way in the beginning that if you need to cough or sneeze, you do this because your hands are sterile. Okay. But that's not an intuitive way to cough or sneeze. The most intuitive way is to put your hand over your face. So then you have this and you can then go touch your neighbor and begin part of that in addition to the aerosolization. So I think that it's it's um, uh, a real uh, uh, a, a real thing. That's it's, it's not just simply one or the other, it's a combination. And I just put up a couple of pictures. You can see in Giannistici, um, people are really in each other's faces and they're singing rather loudly. We have the Westminster Choir and how would you space them out so that you had six feet in between each of them? You would need a football stadium. So these are um, technical challenges to you as performers as to how we can get an artistic message across when we have all of these uh, challenges of distance and separation. Next slide, please. So this was in the New York Times just the other day, and it just really um, crystallizes everything that Dr. Milton has talked about in terms of this miasma of particles traveling from, this was the index case right there, uh, traveling across uh, to infect other people. Next, next slide. And they showed that, again, you can see in the number of feet that it goes, you know, 16 feet. So how are you going to get how are you going to get the Westminster Choir out there and to perform? And how acoustically is that going to impact the audience when they're that far away um, from each other? So um, these are our real problems, and they're you know these are problems. The problems 
my personal feeling, and I think a lot of the literature that's coming out, Bill Gates just wrote a really good article about it, is it's not going to be only social distancing which can flatten the curve, but we do need a lot of testing, we need vaccines, we need other treatments in order to be able to shrink that social distancing safely. That's the key, safely. Um, next slide, please. So um, the keys to kind of jump ahead here, the keys, I think, and this we had talked about a little bit um, between the, the four of us uh, on Sunday, is widespread testing. Currently, the PCR polymerase chain reaction testing is extremely sensitive. Um, in our institution, there's a three to 5% false negative. Um, a lot of it had to do with, we were using a different test before, but when we got the PCR test, things got better, and the people doing the test were um, a lot better. Now, many of you have probably already read the uh, article by Bill Gates that came out a couple of days ago, talking about different kinds of testing. Um, and uh, one of the things that he is talking about and trying to develop is something called a rapid diagnostic test. Now, you know, before we get all excited because, you know, this is a little swab you can stick just in the anterior part of your nose versus going all the way back and feeling like somebody just put an ice pick in your brain, um, that it's not as sensitive as the PCR test. Okay, so until it can be as sensitive as the PCR test, um, you know, and you also need to be symptomatic for it to be positive. Um, it's not safe. It is not, it would not be the easy, safe thing. Now they are working on some different tests and they're trying to get them to be as sensitive as the PCR test. And that I think will be a major advance if it's something like Bill Gates is talking about having it almost like a home pregnancy test. Um, where you could just take it, um, and I'll, I'll show this to you, you know, take it to the choir, and we're gonna talk about a potential way to screen safely. Okay, next slide, please. So what are you going to need? Really, I mean, um, because I deal in your airways, um, I'm relatively sensitive to, you know, dying. Um, uh, we really need a vaccine developed. It's probably going to take about 18 to 24 months. You know, usually people in the U.S. are not that patient. There are some new drug treatments coming along, but if they're not overall efficacy of 95% or better, it's not going to help us. But they're working on it, and hopefully in 6 to 12 months, we will see some more developments in that area. Until then, Social dif distancing um, is, is key. Masks, gloves, spacing is going to be really um, ideal. So when I think of how you can come back into a group situation and have the least amount of risk, this would be my scenario. That first of all, you all have to agree that there's, the risk is never going to be zero. You need to assume three to five percent, okay? Um, you screen at the door. It would be wonderful if this home PCR test becomes something that could be a gold standard, and it's not now, it's still under development. Um, and that people come in and there is a person either the assistant choir director or somebody affiliated that not is not a member of the choir, comes in, you do your little test in a private space, they watch you do the test, if it's negative, they ask you the questions, they do a temperature check, and one of the other things that has been very, very sensitive is looking at people's O2 saturations with a pulse oximeter. So those kinds of things 
um, are really uh, important right now. And for not in a group setting, but for you as an individual, it's good to know what your temperature is. And especially if you have underlying uh, pulmonary disease or cardiac disease, to know what your resting pulse oximetry is. So the pulse ox, the temperature check is, we consider a fever, anything, um, the, a, a normal temperature is less than 99.4. 99.4 and above, um, at our institution, you get sent home. A pulse oximetry check that's below 94% starts raising questions, okay? But there's a lot of people with asthma, COPD, and heart conditions, you know, and just general aging who come trotting in around 94%. So that's why it's very important to know what you are first. But if you're at 99% and you're not feeling well and you get a pulse oximetry and it says that you're 89 or 90 or 92, you probably would want to go and get a COVID test. No question. Um, so, but that does bring up really important issues about privacy. You know, who's managing this data? How can you um, de-identify it enough that you find out exactly, you know, you know, everybody gets tested, but instead of recording everything, you say, okay, on the initial eval, Everybody in the choir passed. So they had a normal temperature, they had a normal pulse ox, they were PCR no, negative. They come in the next time and you go, they just, all it says on the sheet is choir member A, check, they passed. Choir member B, check, they passed. Doesn't have any personal information on there. And you, you know, and everybody, you know, it could be your name, it could just be a number, it could be a letter, you mix it up so that nobody really knows, you know, you don't go down, down, down the choir road going A, B, C, D, no, don't do that. So that people don't really know who you are. So, um, but it, these are, you know, these are real issues. Um, these are things that are things that we can aspire to. We don't have it now. We don't have this now. May I have the next slide? Now, this is what a lot of people are talking about, and I'm going to just say it's high risk, okay? Again, you all have to buy into it that you're going to be way above the 3 to 5% false negative with this, which is just a screening criteria at the door for symptom screenings, temperature check, pulse ox oximetry. There's, you know, there's, there's a lot of a problem with that just because as Dr. Milton said, there is a lot of people who spread this virus while they're completely asymptomatic for 24, 48 hours, okay? So that would be um, a real, real problem um, because, you know, everybody, you could pass this and still be highly contagious, okay? And then you're together for two or three hours. Um, okay, can I have the next slide? So we have uh, had a lot of people saying, well, you know, I can sing with a mask or is there some sort of barrier that you can use? Okay, so thinking back to what I wear when I'm examining or a patient or doing surgery on a patient now, I have an N95 mask, I have goggles, I have eye shield, with a droplet resistant barrier that comes down and tucks into my gown, okay? And um, so it's short of having like the space hoods that the orthopedic surgeons use to go in and do joint replacements. But they also have an O2 supply that is on their belt that circulates air for them. There's no circulation in here for this. So there are no barriers that are currently safe for singing. Next slide. Because as you know, attractive as an N95 mask is, it's like, oh, nothing gets through there. So nothing goes in, nothing goes out, unless it's not completely fit tested. 
So you have to go and have somebody put the mask on you. They will look at how it fits. They have you breathe in and out. And then what they do is they have, they aerosolize, they aerosolize a bitter taste. And if you can taste it, then that mask does not fit you. So that's how a fit test is done. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people wearing, the vast majority of people who are walking around with N95s are not fit, fit tested. Um, there is a recirculation of breath. There are uh, studies that were put out like in 2014 to look at what happens if you're doing normal breathing in an N95 mask, not singing for sure, but just some talking and moving around, uh, what happens in, in an hour. And your O2 levels decrease while you're wearing that mask and the CO2 levels that you're rebreathing are going up, okay? So by the end of the day, um, I have a really nice headache. I have a really nice headache. Um, and like I said, most people would find this garb hot. I find it warm going toward hot, but that's because I'm, I'm, always, I'm very cold natured. But when you think about it, I'm in very good health. Most of you are in very good health, but we do have people in our congregations, in our choirs that are not in good health. They have asthma, they have COPD, they have heart disease. If you put something like on this on them, it would be a tremendous strain on their, phys on, on their physiology, on their hearts and their lungs, and could be extremely dangerous. So, um, you know, this, it's a great tool. It's a great medical device and using it if it's not fit tested is just about as good as wearing a regular mask. Next slide. So other barriers. We've heard some wonderfully imaginative and very well thought out solutions to how can I sing without wearing a mask? And all I can say is that there is not one unless you're wearing the mask that the, or the hoods that the orthopedic surgeons wear, which are essentially spacesuits with an oxygen supply um, that would really do it for you. People have talked about veils. Most of the material out there is not droplet proof. So forget that. They talk about, well, what if we sprayed it with a disinfectant? We see hundreds of patients in the emergency room who just with cleaning their house will get uh, toxic exposure and burns into their uh, respiratory tract from the bleach solutions that they're using to clean their garage or whatever. So that is not, it, it is really the wrong thing to do. Um, again, if you had a veil, it would have to be closed at the bottom. And if it was impervious to droplets, again, you would be like in that N95 environment with it decreasing O2 and increasing CO2 as your practice continued, which again could be um, very, very dangerous. So um, these are, they're wonderful ideas and people have you know sent me lots of different suggestions. And I love it because then it makes you think out of the box is, is there a better way? And right now, I, I really don't see one. So we're back to, um, next slide. Um, being patient. One day we will get back to having choruses and orchestras and audiences. The time is going to come because the ingenuity of all of our fantastic researchers have put so much effort into this. It has gone, the research and the technology that is driving this and the achievements that they've made are stunning in this small amount of time. When you think of December and we're just starting into May, that's an amazing, an amazing amount of technology and energy and talent uh, that has been put forward to this with incredible advances. So I would say that the last thing that, you know, again, we had kind of talked about but I see as people are walking around outdoors or 
uh, in buildings is to remember remember the hands because you never know who just sneezed and pushed the elevator button. So, for example, I get out of my car to go into the hospital. I put gloves on and I usually have a paper towel with me so that I can carry my satchel and all I need to do in this hand. I can open the door. I can press the elevator button and have an extra layer of protection between the glove and that surface. So by the time I get to my office, I can drop that and I have two clean gloves that I can then take off and my hands are clean. Okay, so um, paranoia, maybe, but it is one way to protect you and to also decrease the number of people, contaminants onto that surface of everybody. Um, good glove technique is really hard. It's very hard to keep your hands in the right place. I find it hard to keep my hands in the right place. So these are just some of the things that I think are so important. Um, and I can't stress how much I miss hearing all of you sing. I can hardly wait for it to happen again, but I'd rather have a full chorus of 120 people or 80 people versus a chorus of 40 people because that's all that's left in the choir. That's pretty much all I have to say. Tim? Thank you. Dr. Milton, are you still with us? Yeah. I'm here. Uh, I'm Tim Sharp, a director of the American Coral Directors Association. I had COVID-19 uh, pretty early on, and my wife had it. She was in the hospital for about 10 days. I didn't have to be hospitalized myself. Uh, uh, we had really close monitoring, and then our doctor had us go back and have the antibody test, and we both tested positive, of course, for it. And so the question I have, by the time we get all back around to choirs and and, the, and let's say a lot of us are academics and schools starting back in the fall a lot more of us will have had it and and so the question probably is going to come up what about the mingling of us that have had it and those that haven't had it is there some uh hall pass uh for those of us that uh have already contracted the uh the virus and are, are we carriers or people that are exposed to us now? Um, what are the implications for that? Because we are going to have something of a bifurcated world, it looks like, as we go forward. And I can just see, I can see responses being related to uh, those haves and the have-nots. Well, I know Lucinda may have some points to make on this too. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is that in my studies of college students, uh, and looking at uh, seasonal coronaviruses that have been around for a long time is that everybody has antibody to coronaviruses and it doesn't seem to protect them. Mm. So what we don't know yet is how protective and how long lasting the protection will be. A group at Columbia has just published a paper showing that uh, people were getting reinfected with the same coronavirus that they'd had earlier in the year later in the year in a surveillance study that he's been doing uh, up there that's uh, part of the same network of studies that I'm working on. So we don't know that much about how effective and how long lasting coronavirus immunity is. Now, it may be that this virus, because it's different enough from others, that A, we don't have immunity against it to begin with because what the uh, immunity of the other viruses didn't seem to cross react and help us at all. Uh, maybe it'll be different. Um, and maybe we'll be able to come up with um, vaccines that stimulate us to produce very effective antibodies. I heard some uh, encouraging presentations this morning on an NIH conference call about that, but we don't really know yet. You know, it's um, just to put it in a little perspective, uh, NIH released this spring a request for proposals to identify how influenza is transmitted because after 100 years of studying influenza, we still don't know how it's transmitted. And we still haven't been able to make vaccines that are effective across 
all influenza viruses and last to keep you immune for a long time. And we've only been studying this virus for five months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would suggest that, you know, even though you've had it, you, you, still want to try to avoid it. And I think it's better that rather than bifurcating and having different groups of people that we all continue to practice this. Uh, uh, the other thing is then you're not going to get into the thing of like, well, show me your papers. Are you really immune? <laughs> I mean, you know, talk about privacy things and issues. I mean, and so when you see the guy walking around in the grocery store without the mask on and he says oh i'm safe i already had it i'm over it you know, like do you want to believe him or not i don't know <laughs> i mean yeah it just gets really really messy and given what we don't know you don't know even if he is telling you the truth that it's that he isn't capable of getting reinfected and reinfecting you and do we have different opinions about ages and how the, the, the virus affects them and how that might affect some of the things uh, or types of rehearsals that might go on? Well, we know that all age groups are affected. Um, there have been children who are dying from this. Um, of course, most of them are very healthy and they manage that their mortality rate is a lot less but there are children who have asthma there are children who have congenital cardiac disease there are people who you know have uh that are immunocompromised um so i think that um actually continuing to uh treat all age groups fairly the same is probably good. You know, that's one of the reasons why they closed all the schools is because, you know, these these kids can, you know, they serve as a congregation point. They can be asymptomatic carriers and they, you know, these close uh, environments can then cause a spread of, of the disease. So um, I would say that I wouldn't be cavalier with my elementary school students. Uh, you know, their kids are going to be fine. Um, I would be perhaps, you know, I'll go out on women and say slightly less worried about them, especially if they're all pretty healthy. Um, versus many of our choirs, many of our church choirs, um, where you have a large proportion of people who are um, more mature and um, have many more uh, underlying diseases. There, I think you do need to have a heightened awareness of, of who your population is. The, there's a definite difference between a college choir and an adult, uh, more elderly choir that you're going, more, many of the volunteer choirs, the church choirs or, the symphony chorus choirs where there's a big mix, but a more uh, preponderance of people who are um, older. So I think you have to have heightened awareness with everyone and on um, maybe a little bit less for the kids, but not, oh, it's just fine. Um, and definitely for the older populations, um, you need to be really, really careful. Um, and I'm just going to mention it because it's a big thing here in South Carolina. And I'm very happy to say that right now there's been a tremendous effort to put out uh, PCR testing in our rural and economically disadvantaged and racially, racially um, uh, heavy areas where there's more African Americans, more um, Hispanics. In, uh, that they've they've put the virus the viral testing out there free of charge, um, and uh, they are holding clinics to try to make sure that we we get these people, um, which I think is is very important. Um, 
the the medical disparities between different different ethnic categories is is staggering, and many of our um, colleagues who are um, African American are much more at risk um, because their health is generally not as good. Marty, I think you had a question. How have you seen, you know, obviously with only five months of data to all this, how do the, is there any indicators of other um, activities that might not be as intense in gathering as singing in a choir might be that would be indicators that we, that um, would give us some hope um, or, or some of that is, is some of that that you're tracking in other activities or other industries or markets? Um, so I know that, um, you know, a lot of our professional musicians, um, and singers, you know, are doing a lot of, uh, you, you see it all over. They're doing virtual shows, they're doing, uh, Facebook shows, um, and they actually, um, are very creative. They actually have a way to get, uh, tips on Facebook, so it helps meet the bills. Um, so I would say that um, it's, it's very hard to think of, uh, unless you have a way to really socially space people um, uh, and have a good, a good environment, like uh, to really um, have a, a, a real safe way. We did talk on Sunday about how do you, as a college professor, or um, you evaluate your your incoming freshmen and do your basic first first lesson. Trying to do that virtually is probably going to be very hard because there are some acoustic differences when you have the electronic filtration um, in a remote setting. So um, again they're making sure that they've, you know, that they've been tested the day before they see you um, and not any farther out than that. Um, and as long as you're healthy and everything else, then you have, you know, a small risk, um, three to 5%. And here's where everything that Dr. Milton has said, is you can maximize your studio space so that the ventilation is good, if the ceiling is tall enough so you can get a, a UV system in there. Um, because I believe that um, on our conversation on, on Sunday, Dr. Milton said that you have to have like a, a minimum of a seven foot ceiling or it has to be seven to nine feet you, in order you, you to- You need to have the lights installed above seven feet. So you need uh, probably an eight foot ceiling minimum to be able to do it. And the higher, the better, actually, you can, if it's a much higher ceiling, you can actually flood that space with a lot of UV. Because you have to remember that, you know, UV can be very damaging to your eyes, your skin. Um, so it has to be, it has to be far away or yet you, you're introducing another potential um, uh, you may also hear a lot about a far UV, a 222 nanometer um, UV that is being studied by a group at Columbia. But so far, there's really not much data on safety or effectiveness of that. Whereas the older UV, which is basically a fluorescent light technology that is designed in a way that instead of making visible light, it makes UV, uh, there's, there's data on that going back 70 years and uh, we know how to use it. You have to be careful with it because it can cause eye ir irritation. Um, it's very similar to welder's flash, uh, but um, it, if, uh, if it's done well, it can be very effective. And this has been demonstrated in, in field experiments with TB. Catherine? Yes, thanks. Um, so this is a question for both of our esteemed doctors, I think. Uh, 
we're seeing some questions come in about does this mean UV exposure translates into rehearsals outside or performances outside? Is there any more? And of course, I know airflow would play into this. Um, I'm, and that's part one. Part two is, especially based on uh, Dr. Halstead's slides, I'm really wondering, um, can you imagine a safe way to have a rehearsal right now? Um, no. I probably <laughs> can't. Um, unless you did it, it, unless it's a small group and it's outside and the wind is not at your back. <laughs> okay. So, for example, my neighbor actually belongs to a barbershop quartet and they were out, yay, yeah, and they were out this past weekend on the front lawn, spaced <laughs> out, good wind conditions. And they were practicing and i think that that is safe as long as they're not touching each other okay. <laughs> so um but at this point i i don't think that there is truly a safe way unless you can get the entire choir pcr tested within 24 hours of your rehearsal um mm -hmm. to have a safe rehearsal and you're still then at at three to five percent risk but you know what we're never going to be at zero risk right so yeah. um the I, genie is out of the bottle yeah <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. thank you what about uh you know, we've had several questions about congregational singing i know uh Dr. Milton, you, you brought up that one, a couple of studies there, um, and we've we've had a couple of questions about what about humming in a rehearsal, having a rehearsal with humming, does that, you know, lessen anything? Uh, obviously, we're still emitting breath through our noses, et cetera, but uh, what, what about that? I have no data. I don't like to speak when I have no data. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't think that there's, again, when you see the difference between, you know, people talking and people talking loudly, there's, there is a span and a difference, but it's not, it's, it's not orders of magnitude. And so I would say that, um, I, I, I don't think humming is, is the answer. In fact, I was reading, I can't remember where I saw it now, um, but uh, in Germany, you know, they've banned uh, religious services and singing. And one of the churches, I believe it was the Catholic church, felt that quiet praying and quiet singing was still acceptable. And there's this big dichotomy among the religious um, groups in in Germany about this, and um, I think that we have the facts, and we we have the facts. We know how far these particles can go. We know that many of the spaces, religious spaces, you know, because of their historic glory, don't have very good ventilation. Um, I I just don't think that that just you know that saying oh if i hum it's okay um the person next to you could be one of those super emitters and when he hums it's a whole different thing about than what you're doing when you're humming so it's not only you personally it's the person in your in your space that you have to also think about we're not all the same some people are super spreaders some people hardly emit at all um, you so still... I, I, I spent some time uh, yesterday interviewing somebody who was a member of a 125 member choir that was rehearsing St. John's Passion and which uh, after the week of uh, a rehearsal on Tuesday and Saturday and performance on Sunday, in the next two weeks, 101 members of the choir became infected. And uh, it turns out that the one of the first first people who was symptomatic was the choir director conductor, 
who at the first rehearsal sang all the soloist parts. Hmm. So you can have one person, and and so and and one of the things I I think about is is the better trained singer you are, the more you are going to use all of your air capacity, your total lung capacity, and by using that last bit of air you're going to collapse small airways and then take a deep breath for that next measure open up those airways and generate aerosol fine particle aerosols that are going to hang in the air quite effectively and if you're projecting your voice i mean i, I don't haven't seen any studies of you know trained soloists classical soloists but i'm sure that they can project a good volume and they're loud. And if loudness is important, who's louder? Yeah. Like so, someone with a big loud laugh, right? A party <laughs> laugh, right? I mean, those are the same kind of things. I'm yeah. known to have one of those, right? Yeah. I'm not sure I can laugh as loud as some soprano, opera sopranos I've heard. <laughs> well, you know, uh, let's kind of wrap up this section by just a little bit of conversation with both of you about what are the signposts we can look for and, and when when do we you know when do we know it'll be safe to sing again and, and the kinds of venues and the ways we're talking about well I think that again it's going to take a long time and you know, optimistically, if we had a vaccine that was very effective, and you know, treatments that would reduce, um, you know, have a 95% cure rate, that would be the the most safe. Then you probably would have very little to worry about. However, right now, I think if we have widespread testing um, that can be rapid that has a very low false negative rate um, and ev everybody buys into doing it you know you can't have one person who says well i'm not going to do it because then the whole house of cards comes down um, and um, then i think it would be safe now if you look at the american academy of sports medicine and the national collegiate athletic association what they're i mean they're basically saying is these are the rules and if you don't buy the rules you don't get to play and they're talking about COVID testing frequent screening athletes are now getting significant cardiovascular testing in addition to their regular um pre-athletic uh, training because of the effect that the COVID virus has been shown to have on the cardiac um, myocardium. And um, they are just being very rigid. And they say, if you're not gonna do this and you're not gonna do this and you're not gonna do this, you are not part of the team. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You're not part of the team. Um, and in many ways, a college choir um even a church choir is the same um and so that's why i said that you know everybody in my slide you know you need to have an understanding and an agreement that these are the rules that we're going to use to come together and and make music and celebrate you know the glory of of vocal music so um and that's tough because that means that you you know you give up a little bit of individual freedom uh, for not only the good of yourself but for the good of all. And um, but that's what that's what the team sports are doing. If you want to play soccer, you want to play uh, basketball, you want to play football. Um, these are the rules, and if you don't want to if you don't want to do the if you don't want to follow the guidelines, you're not you're not on the team. Um, easy to say, more easy to say in a school environment than in a church or a volunteer choir environment. But for now, I think that that's what we're going to need. 
Dr. Milton, you have anything to add to that? No, I think that really covers it. I think that um, meanwhile, as we wait uh, for the high capacity testing capability, point of care testing or point of use testing capability to come online, we need to be thinking about the ventilation and air sanitation in the in practice rooms and concert halls and, and so forth. Uh, and, and looking to see what we can do about that. And uh, I know that universities are also thinking about that in terms of just how you bring students back to residence halls. Um, and, you know, many of our residence halls are older buildings and they don't have modern ventilation systems. And, um, you know, can you, can you even open the windows and, you know, uh, and, and what kind of ventilation can you get if you do that? And all those things have to be thought through and what density can you then have in those spaces? So I think we'll be working on those things as we go along. And then maybe we'll start with being outside like your barbershop quartet friends and, um, uh, you know, in, in the summer and, and early fall that, that might be doable. As we get into colder weather, um, hopefully by then we've been able to get the testing ramped up and improve the indoor environments. And I think you are uh, chair of the committee at the University of Maryland that's dealing with you know some of the policies that you're setting up to reopen potentially reopen campus. Um, so you're dealing with all these uh, issues daily. Yeah, well, um, there's, you know, committees have spawned committees upon committees. And so I, I'm, it's not clear to me that my committee is in charge anymore. But uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, we will be thinking about what policies to put in place before the next pandemic. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I believe well, that. Really... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that, um, Dr. Milton had brought up uh, on Sunday is that there have been certain universities who have pre-planned and have much of this in place. So it's making their uh, reopening a lot, uh, a lot smoother because they have the testing, they have the ventilation, they have uh, systems in place. But the key there, um, and I know Dr. Bilton has said this several times, is it's a systems approach. I and mean, we have to have a systematic approach, a systems and institutional approach where everybody um, abides by the, 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 the rules. But mm -hmm. well, we're gonna loop back around to some of the other questions people have. Uh, and just want everyone to know that we will post the PowerPoints from both our speakers so far, uh, along with the resources, uh, along with the recording. So uh, you can be sure that we'll have those available to you. Um, and uh, so now we want to turn just for a, a little bit and talk about some other issues, and then we're going to we're going to loop back around to just some of this conversation. And so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Catherine. Thank you so much. Alan, are you going to, am I going to be able to do the PowerPoint or are you? Uh, you should be able to when I make you. You have to, I, I have to have the power. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on just a second. Let us switch out to the camera so our other speaker can come on. Okay. Go. And let me switch to you. Great. Okay. All right, thank you so much. So I wanted to share some data with you from uh, about audiences. When you think about what we've just heard, we've started the most important place, obviously with um, the medical uh, the medical implications, the medical data that we need in order to think about the other implications for our operations, for singers, ensembles, and um, audiences. 
So since we are mostly doing what we do with our singing in order to perform, I thought I would start with audiences. So the data I'm sharing with you is from a very influential voice in the conversation about how arts and culture entities are going to recover, uh, come back into operations after the COVID crisis. And her name is Colleen Dillon Schneider. And let me see if I have done this right. You should be seeing my screen. Is that working? Mm -hmm. Is it working? Yes. Yes. Oh, technology. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Um, so Colleen is the Chief Market Engagement Officer for a research um, and predictive technology company called Impact Research. And her website has a great name. It's called Know Your Own Bone, with a big shout out to Henry David Thoreau. And she generously shares uh, Impact's market research and behavioral economics data that particularly has relevance, oh, I'm getting a feedback thing, has some relevance to uh, nonprofits and performing arts organizations. Uh, and the way they gather the data is through a variety of ongoing studies, including a major national study that's uh, been going on for a while, plus uh, constant monitoring of about 224 cultural entities, everything from uh, botanical gardens and museums to symphony orchestras uh, to look at audience behaviors. So uh, since the uh, COVID crisis hit about eight weeks ago, I know it's been longer, but they've been doing this research for about eight weeks. They've been collecting data on audiences intent to return to cultural institutions. Um, and the most recent update to this work, it was May 4th. And in that report that she put on her website, Know Your Own Bone, you won't be able to forget that name. Uh, she has uh, also, the data is sliced and diced by regions, which I think is important because of everyone on the call today, on the webinar today, the regions are responding differently. and. Uh, so it, I think that could be particularly useful. Um, experts tell us that intent to visit is among the best available metric for reliably uh, predicting audience behavior. And it answers questions like, if we build it, will they come? Um, it, when we reopen, will people come back? Uh, when do people think they'll come back? and how is the current environment impacting future plans and how's that changing as, the, as our nation's response is changing. And so here's what they've found. The news is mixed. And the good news is that, especially by this May 4th update, um, it's getting more and more clear that our uh, visitors to cultural institutions, our audiences, are now thinking, uh, it, they've stopped thinking if things reopen and now they're going to when, and they are actually starting to make their plans. And uh, so there's been a notable increase in intention to visit a cultural or performance entity within one month. And uh, an, in the three month measurement is actually very similar to 2019. So that's really a very, very good news for us, I think. However, the findings do show that people may be inclined to visit different types of institutions, that the distribution is changed. Um, and this is very important for groups like choruses to consider as they're trying to figure out future performances. This slide, it's a little bit dense. If you, I don't, I, I'll just explain it very briefly. I just wanted to show you uh, Colleen and her company's work in terms of the types of organizations that they sample. So the numbers here at the end, I'm not gonna go into great detail. 50, a, a number of 50 means that the intent to visit that institution is the same as it was before the COVID crisis. That the person responding said, yeah, I, I'm, I have no chance. If it's above 50, it means they're more likely to attend than they would have been before COVID hit. And if it's under 50, they're less likely. So more likely 
for good reasons, I think, uh, would be outdoor activities. And that is what the data is showing, is that people are much more comfortable, obviously, returning to things that would be outdoors and less likely to be comfortable way down here at the bottom, movie theaters and performing arts, uh, where they are enclosed in a space. So, uh, this is not surprising and also any museums where they are supposed to interact and touch things. So it shows that also uh, what they're saying is that people will have expectations that operations have changed to um, recognize the new environment we're in. So the question they had asked was without operational changes, uh, to prioritize safety. One in four people feel comfortable attending exhibit-based institutions, and one in seven feel comfortable attending performance-based. So the next question then is, what would make people feel safe? So they did this uh, survey question as well, and found that these were the top considerations for feeling safer to return to a performance or exhibit entity. So the dark blue is performance as compared to exhibit-based entity in light blue. So this, <laughs> the demand for the availability of the coronavirus vaccine is higher for those considering returning to a performance. Um, the other thought Thing, the other things I thought was interesting on this slide was um, obviously hand sanitizer. We better all invest in that. And then um, the no significant changes necessary, I feel comfortable. The blue line is, is significantly less than the light blue line. So uh, I think our audiences uh, and what they've concluded is that they will want to know and see change to feel comfortable returning to performance spaces. So here are things that we can control. I'm not saying should, because I think the, I think the decision tree here to incorporate some of the um, mitigations that the doctors have shared with us that are so interesting, they're also quite resource intensive. That, so this is not a should, but this is what can we control? The ability to be outside, absolutely. Hand sanitizer, make those back alley deals for your hand sanitizer. Avoiding long lines, trying to get into venues. On-site health monitoring, that certainly was one that would make people feel more comfortable. Um, so to sum this up, we have some sample operational plans available in our resources, certainly on Chorus America's uh, COVID page, and um, I believe Nats as well, and, and actually all of us um, that have been generously given to us. I know in Chorus America has a wonderful plan from the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus that is like a handbook of things to consider as you're planning to reopen operations in terms of rehearsals. Um, I think Gala Choruses also has quite a bit of resources on that for theirs. So uh, at this point, um, I know there's a, a push to develop guidelines around this, and we'll hear more from our guests on this. And I am delighted to have with us to help us continue this conversation about what to consider as you're uh, looking at the operational aspects of this. We have two experts with us, Tom Clareson, the Project Director of Performing Arts Readiness, and Molly Quinlan Hayes of Arts Ready. Um, she's the Director of the Arts Ready Project underneath South Arts, based in Atlanta, and they've been very patient, and I really appreciate them. Uh, Tom, I'm going to have you start, and I know that you have done a lot of work to uh, talk to organizations about a phased reopening process. Mm -hmm. And before you jump into that, I would really like you to talk a little bit about your super secret other life, which is as a board member for the Lancaster Corral. And we really appreciate board members. You're doing God's work. 
Um, how are things in Lancaster <laughs> with the Lancaster Corral? And uh, tell us what's yeah. going on in your region. Well, it's interesting. I'm based in the uh, central Ohio area, and uh, a lot of uh, both local and arts organizations in the area constantly talking and trying to plan what's next. Um, I am a, a board member with Lancaster Corral, and um, we uh, th that group had to cancel a uh, late April concert. Um, also, uh, my father-in-law is a member of uh, the Lancaster Community Chorus, which is a large and growing um, organization that has uh, huge crowds at its performances. Um, they had to cancel a late March performance. And the, the thing that really concerns me the most, uh, I think, was that both of those organizations in the past have performed at a, sort of an institution in Central Ohio, um, the Lancaster Festival, uh, which is a 10 day long festival that happens in uh, mid July. And uh, just within the past two weeks, we heard that that uh, has been canceled. And it's the first time I believe in 35 years that that's been canceled. Um, so uh, it's a, a, you know, a concern we're seeing uh, all types of festivals uh, being, being canceled. So one of the things that we are seeing is what can people do alternatively and what can they do to sort of plan uh, during the time that they're down. And what I wanted to talk about briefly tonight was um, considering uh, business continuity issues for your organizations thinking about reopening and restarting from sort of the logistical point of view. And, uh, you know, once we get the okay from the scientists like those who are on our uh, panel from the from the medical professionals, uh, what can we do to stay ready and be ready to move forward? Um, so I wanted to talk about that. Uh, but I also wanted to preface things just for a moment talking about the work that I've been doing in this area. It's part of a project called Performing Arts Readiness, Readiness, as Catherine said. It's a project that's funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And we've been around uh, since 2017. And we look to help performing arts organizations in a couple of different ways. Have them know how to protect their assets, have them know how to sustain operations in the long term, and be prepared for emergencies. And one of the things for this group that I wanted to mention is there are a lot of things that you can do after this session is over. We have a series of about 10, and we're going to add two more uh, free webinars on a variety of topics, everything from uh, risk assessment uh, for your facilities, groups, et cetera, pandemic planning. Uh, we had a, a, a debuted a session on that last week. Uh, crisis communications, stress management, uh, a number of other areas. And we hold these on about a monthly basis as live presentations, but we also have recordings of all of the presentations available uh, so you can get to them 24-7, 365. So that's one uh, activity where we have experts from all over the country, actually all over the world, who are talking about some of these issues. And the other thing that I really want to point people to is um, starting with our first grant and uh, moving into this current uh, grant that we have, we have been regranting to about uh, 40 to 45 organizations uh, each grant. Um, grants of $7,250, uh, which can be used to bring in facilitators, consultants, um, others to help develop readiness plans. Um, so uh, we had about 41 of those that were done in our last grant and have funding for 42. Our applications for those were just announced a week and a half ago. And so uh, take a look on our website, which is performingartsreadiness.org, and take a look at those planning grant guidelines, uh, because we've had uh, some interest in them, but we have not been flooded yet because people are looking at so many other issues um, with applications for them. So there is a time to uh, get applications in. Um, you know, I would love to go ahead and just talk a little bit about what we're seeing uh, as an important. Yes, 
Sure, okay, of uh, the choral and community chorus performances is that both your um, ensembles and your audiences may include people from a wide variety of age ranges. And we talked about that in our last segment, but because of that, and because I know how popular and how large the crowds for some of your events can be, I want you to be able make, to make sure that your performers and artists uh, are, are safe. So we talked about consideration of some of these issues, but I wanna go a little bit further with a couple of sort of bullet points here. You know, will you consider testing ensemble members before practices? Should you develop a policy statement on the health of your performers and have them sign it? That's another thing we're hearing some groups considering. Uh, will you place any age limits, upper and lower age limits on your audiences? We have not talked as much about audiences, but looking at that, um, people have been saying, should we do temperature checks on audience members when they come in? Uh, will you require or at least suggest audience members to wear masks when attending performances? Um, all of these are issues that I think should be considered. And one of the things that I know, I'm gonna be on a board meeting tomorrow, uh, uh, tomorrow evening, uh, uh, a uh, <clears throat> Zoom uh, board meeting. And these are the kind of issues that we're gonna be talking about where we have board members and artist reps who uh, will we'll talk about this kind of thing. I know that getting back to practicing and performing is a concern. And with that in mind, something that's really important is to take a look at the federal and state policies and mandates. And certainly, they have, large venues are told they can operate under strict physical distancing protocols in phase one of the president's opening up America again policy. But from what I'm hearing and from what I know, many performing arts organizations are planning to wait until phase three when the distancing protocols are more limited. And these are coming, these uh, areas and discussions that I'm having are with people from the theater world, uh, people from the concert production community for large scale concerts and from the dance community as well. Um, Many states, like my home state of Ohio, have very detailed and quite strict policies and timelines for opening. So I think consulting those resources are gonna be important as well. And there's one group that not many of us had on our disaster plans, if we had those plans in the past, and that was making friends with and creating a relationship with your public, public health department, whether it's local public health or county public health department. And I would say, as we want to see where these trends are going, get in touch with those folks uh, and, and work with them uh, as you're trying to do your planning and they'll be able to help you quite a bit with that. Um, some other policies for your organizations and performers to consider, if your organization doesn't have a disaster plan or a continuity of operation plans yet, now is the time to develop one. And Molly and I have a lot of samples that we can share and point you towards. Um, you and your performers also should have family or personal disaster plans. And there are a ton of good resources available at ready.gov. In fact, um, way before the pandemic started, we have been pointing people towards some of the, the tools at ready.gov. Um, the other thing is that we've seen with many choral groups and choruses, um, do you have performers who are traveling in from other cities or other states and uh, who will, will do performances with you? And you need to make sure, are they coming from an area where it's a hotspot? Um, you know, and will those people uh, who are coming from areas that might be under some level of restrictions or under different state, state restrictions, how will you work with them? A few other policy areas, additional policies. Um, one of the things that Catherine and Molly and I talked about in a preliminary call that we had was insurance issues. And I certainly am not going to say uh, that there is uh, a level of insurance issues uh, that, that I know a ton about, but I think that if you can uh, review your insurance policy soon, and talk with your insurance agents or brokers about coverage and liabilities, that's gonna be very important. If you don't have a lawyer 
or insurance person on your board of trustees yet, it's a good time to get one now to help with these discussions that are coming up. In addition, you may have an insurance policy renewal coming up. And what changes would you want to pursue in that? A couple of other paperwork areas you could consider updating uh, your financial plans, your performer contracts, performance and rehearsal site agreements, performance licenses, your public relations and marketing databases, and your patron database. And this ties in to directly what Dr. Milton was talking about. Um, now is also a good time to find out about the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system in your performance area. Um, how often are the systems cleaned? Do they bring in outside air? Um, you know, finding all of those things are important as well. So there's some level of that building infrastructure and technology. One last thing I wanted to talk about before I pass things over to Molly. I know it's difficult to replace the sound of voices together in a live choir or chorus setting. But if we're looking at, as we've heard from the doctors, additional months or what some experts say might be another one to two years of working with it in the sort of pandemic and social distancing environment, we need to consider how to keep our skills sharp, how to plan for virtual activities and also ramp up for our re reopening. So I think the idea of having performers practice by themselves the same amounts as they would normally practice is important. Um, one thing that I've seen that's been incredible over the past week, can your performers start to learn or improve their technology skills that they already have? Um, I recently saw the college senior daughter of one of our board members from the Corral, um, her first attempt at video multi-tracking, and it was amazing. Uh, she was doing Bill Withers' Lean on Me, so it was, uh, you know, sort of heart-rending, but it was wonderful as well. And we're also seeing on a professional uh, singer level, we're seeing some great creativity from performers like Dua Lipa and others who are doing uh, virtual crowdsourcing for videos and performances. Um, can we look at three to four performers doing a small virtual performance together? Uh, do you have inventory, recordings, CDs, T-shirts, uh, you know, programs uh, that you can uh, sell uh, on your website at this time? And uh, one other thing, and I'm not sure how this translates to the choral community as well, but I know in uh, the uh, singer-songwriter uh, community in Ohio, uh, they're developing a virtual tip jar. Uh, a virtual tip jar for being able to give tips to performers who are doing things in a virtual setting. So I think with those ideas in mind, I want to hand over the microphone to my colleague Molly Quinlan Hayes, who has really great information on disaster preparedness planning and a number of other topics as well. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, as uh, was mentioned in the beginning, I'm Molly Quinlan Hayes. I manage the Arts Ready National Initiative out of South Arts in Atlanta, um, and we're here to make sure that every arts organization can have a readiness plan um, and have a plan B. So I'm going to really talk for a very quick, about five minutes on from that perspective. Um, there is a cycle of readiness, response, and recovery in disaster management circles, um, which is an actual thing. Um, and most of today we've been talking about the response, recovery, and kind of restart. So I'm going to fill some uh, concepts in about the readiness piece of the cycle um, and then look at some current some ideas about our current situation. So most of what I'm going to talk about focuses on organizations rather than individual artists, but I think there's a lot of hopefully crossover information that y'all will find helpful. So what is readiness for arts and cultural organizations? Um, we believe that it is having policies, processes, documents, and trainings and drills in place to keep your operations going and building that concept into just your organizational DNA as part of your planning and strategizing and operations. Why is planning important? Um, we don't make good decisions in when we're panicked. Our cognitive level drops. So it's good when you can take some quiet space and mind space to be thinking about this. And I'll probably repeat a few of the ideas that Tom uh, offered in terms of making the most use of this time. Um, 
why is planning important? Again, uh, you need to think about all kinds of hazards. They're both human caused and natural or technological. So at Arts Ready, we recommend this particular framework for readiness planning using an all hazards concept, which I'll define, and looking at all of your critical functions so that you have a plan be a backup plan for each one of them. All hazards means that if your access to one of your resources or one of your critical business functions is cut off, you need to know how you're going to respond. Um, in normal times, say, if your accompanist couldn't come to rehearsal because um, they had a fever or they eloped and went to Tahiti or their basement just flooded and they have to deal with it, that mm -hmm. doesn't matter. What it means is you can't get your accompanist to rehearsal. So how are you going to have a backup in place? Um, and what are the critical functions of arts organizations? Well, over the last 10 years, a group of arts administrators, business continuity experts, and cult people from the cultural heritage sector have worked together to come up with what we believe are the 10 critical business functions that you need to be thinking about. Your people. These are artists, crew, administrators, audiences, volunteers, board members. Your programs, concerts, educational activities, competitions, special events, and fundraisers. Facilities, any spaces that you use for your administration, for ticket sales, for um, rehearsal, performances, storage, preparation spaces. Your finances, which include, of course, insurance, information technology, communications, collections and assets, which is a concept that a lot of performing arts organizations don't necessarily think about. But certainly your music library, your merchandise, all those kinds of things are assets and collections that you need to, uh, any instruments that you um, own. Uh, trainings and drills to make sure that people are regularly updated on what their role should be. And finally, community, which is really how do you work within your, um, your community of practice, of artistic practice, but also your geographical community. Tom mentioned being in touch with your public health office. You should also have a relationship with your local emergency management office. This crisis is different than most others because the threat is invisible and there's no sense of an end to it. Unlike a fire or a protest or a tornado, we just don't know when this is going to stop and we'll return to something like normal. So here are a couple of, of my personal tenets when I talk to people about readiness planning. The first one is no guilt. Start where you are. You probably got some elements of a readiness plan already in place. You just need to consciously think about collecting those. Um, if you haven't thought in this space very much or at all, that's fine. Um, both at performingartsreadiness.org um, and at artsready.org, we have a ton of resources in our library, in our planning tools, in our sample plans for you to look at how you might take some first easy steps to do that. Um, what might be helpful in this particular moment related to what I've just described, one is communications protocol, making sure that you have the ability to be in touch quickly and clearly with everyone that you need to, your participants, participants your artists, your stakeholders. Make sure that's up to date. Um, now, in March, I was on a few webinars very early in this, and at that point, my advice was you cannot over communicate. Um, I'm kind of second guessing that now because we're all kind of being bombarded with information and all oh, this latest article and the study. And so you might want to be more of a gatekeeper now about your communication. Um, but I think that still we need to be very transparent um, and clear um, when we communicate with people. And if we don't know the answers, there are a lot of questions we don't have answers to. We just need to honestly say, we don't know. This is where we are right now. Um, we, uh, the medical professionals talked a lot about these issues of privacy and sensitivity, so I'm going to um, skip over that. But you might want to think in terms of, um, of privacy and sensitivity, um, an idea of uh, maybe a safety officer, or an ombudsman. Um, when we help people, organizations develop readiness plans for their organization, we say you need to have a response team and a team leader. It's not necessarily the executive director but someone with, uh, through whom all communication goes in and out. So one person has all the facts and can relay that to the right people. Um, and so that is something that if you don't have one of those, you might want to, particularly as we start moving to the place where you're gonna start gathering back together again in real life. Um, I can imagine that if I were a member of a choir, I would have this incredible tension between 
I love the group. I want to be with the group. They count on me versus I'm anxious and I'm scared and I'm not sure if I want to go there. Again, no guilt, right? We all just have to be in that space where we are and honor that. Um, but also uh, in this, as we come back together, it also um, might be a good idea to have this neutral person who not only is overseeing the things we've talked about, whether it's the sanitizing the space, um, you know, making sure that the screening is going on at the door, all of that, but also who can be the neutral communicator. If I were next to a friend, someone I cared about, but they are, you know, not six feet away or they are sneezing, I don't necessarily want to have to confront them and say, you should go home. But if you have a neutral person who's responsible for that, that activity, you can take any concerns to them and let them handle it. So um, it, it kind of keeps that spirit intact. Um, another obvious tenet in readiness planning is if you see something, say something. For instance, you know, a backpack in the wings that's just suddenly appeared and nobody knows who owns it. Or if you see a stack of chairs blocking the emergency exit, you want to tell somebody. Well, where we are now, again, if you see something, say something, hopefully again to some neutral person. Um, but, um, but we need to take care of ourselves and always be you know, watchful and cautious. Readiness will mean in readiness in general in, uh, needs an investment of time and money. More time than money, actually. It's about making good decisions. Um, as well as also, you know, obviously getting some special equipment that you might need. Um, you should already be investing in really good data backup and storage and security. Um, you should have appropriate levels and types of insurance, as Tom said. Now you're going to have to think about budgeting for masks or sanitizer or um, tests or signage and floor markers for the space. You know, I've seen all these commercial, you know, Walmart, boy, they just, you know, slapped them out there. But you know, it's harder for us, but we're going to have to find some resources to do that. One um, way might be to work collaboratively, and I'll get back to that one in just a moment. Um, someone mentioned Dr. Selig's piece, the paper from the San Francisco Gay Men's Course. If you haven't seen it, do it's wonderful. It's very clear and has a lot of great tips. Um, also, think about how you might have to communicate if you use a shared space. Who else is going to be in that space? Who's going to be responsible for sanitizing it before and after? Do you have landlords or tenants that you need to be talking about a restart? Another thing that I've heard recently is the idea of not make, don't make any big commitments now that, okay, we're gonna do this and, and we're gonna be ready so that in January, we're gonna be ready to go. We have no idea what is coming. So be, be nimble, start small, start you know lower level kinds of stuff, test it out because we might find that we have to put the brakes on it again you know, in the fall. Um, Use this downtime to plan. I'm going to echo some of what Tom said. You know, put things in place. You could re record interviews with some of your, you know, longest standing members. Put together some history with your artistic director. People love to see backstage things. So posting some of those online for your folks who can't um, attend your performances right now. Uh, document historical events. Build in redundancies and cross training. It's so hard for those of us in the arts to cross train, whether it's at a board level or a staff level. You know, you can have one person describe their key jobs and those processes to another person. It's documented and you've also got another trained person. So again, um, use this time by thinking of things that you would have to have put off in a regular time of rehearsal and performance. A quote I heard this morning was great and it was, seek clarity, not certainty. We can't be certain, but if we get rid of the buzz and the anxiety and just kind of really seek clarity, I think that's um, a reasonable way to go about getting through this, um, this particular time. And I'll go back to this issue of community um, and being kind of porous and collaborative. When Catherine invited Tom and I to speak, um, she said that it was the first time that the four hosts of this webinar have worked together. And what a great community. I think that there's a great benefit to doing that if whether it is working in to buy signage in bulk, if all the arts organizations in your neck of the woods get together, or whether it is sharing artists or you know sharing information, this is a great time people want to connect. And you can't do it live in a room with your voice. There are a lot of other ways to be doing it. So thank you. Awesome. Molly, thank you so much. That was so many practical tips. I'm amazed. Helen and do I take yeah, it away? I, I think again, I'll just reiterate that you know all the things I think both Molly and 
don't talk about are so widely applicable to whether we're running a large choral organization or we have a private voice studio somewhere you know uh, in town uh or if we're at a university so or a church so you know uh i think a lot of these considerations are just so important for us all to make and as we're thinking about that and we're thinking about the future uh, Marty and Tim are, are going to talk with us a little bit about what are all the questions we need to answer for ourselves uh, individually and collectively as um, as we move forward. Yeah, and I think you know you we've heard a lot today. I mean, in the past two and a half hours, two hours, there's a lot there. There's a lot of questions that everybody's thinking about right now. They're they're wondering what if. What, what's this? Uh, you heard from Molly and Tom, lots of questions that you could be asking your, you know, your, your, your singers, your artistic directors, the core directors, the boards, I mean, all these various sub-communities within the singing community um, to get direction. Um, and um, there's been a lot there. What hasn't been shared yet, Tim? I mean, that, we, that we've, we've covered, I mean, we've covered a lot today. Um, is there anything else? I mean, you you have practical experience with the Tulsa crowd. Yeah, I see us personally in, in stages now, and I think we're 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 in this sh kind of shock stage right now, and, and uh, it's a reality check today for many of our listeners, our membership. Um, this was a reality check, and they were waiting to uh, hear something, some word. I think we're all going to enter a period in the next two or three months. Um, it won't be chaotic, but it's going to be a discovery period. And and that period is going to be, I think, for all of us, is, is what Molly was just speaking to and Tom, and that is, uh, what can we do? Um, we, we, we're we a little depressed right now. I mean, I know collectively, I feel it. I feel the zeitgeist that, that we're, we're feeling this uh, depression because of what we can't do. And um, that's disheartening. But but the question next, what can we do, is that Molly was just speaking to and Tom, I think that's where we want to turn next. What What is it that we can do? And for me, you know, I'm looking at it as more of a marathon than a sprint. I think we in the choral organizations and, and Nats as well, I, I just loved how we've grown in the last 10 years. I mean, uh, Catherine, the materials that came out from your impact study, um, was, was such a, a shot in the arm for us to say, look, more people singing, uh, chor choral culture growing. So we were on a sprint. We were on a roll. We were on a, a, a bull market, you know. Yeah. And uh, here, yeah. here comes the bear market. And we're, we weren't training for a bear market. We, we just thought it's going to get bigger and bigger and better and better. Um, you know, most of the things I hear Marty uh, said today, you know, ACDA in our mission, we say we're about excellence, uh, uh, inspiring excellence. Most of the solutions that I hear do not lend themselves to excellence. You know, going to a, a Roman amphitheater to rehearse or a, an old uh, outdoor movie theater to space my singers across a car parking lot doesn't sound to me like what we've been moving toward in terms of excellence, uh, or we would have done that already. Um, that's moving away from excellence. It's just saying, how can we basically get our communities together? So I, I personally don't see that as the solution. I, I want to go where Molly and Tom are going, and that is what can we do? And, and frankly, we've got so many, uh, we've got people giving us questions from all over the world right now and offering us some best practices that I'm seeing pop up right now in my, my inbox. And so I think what we want to do, Marty, is um, we, we are encouraged that we are we five organizations are working together we want to go to the next step and say in our next webinar that we want to do sometime in the next month we want to say uh, what can we do and what we want to do is bring together people in the sound areas the guys that are in the physics areas the people that are dealing with these technologies that show us how we can do online ear training how we can do online part singing uh, how we can do what tom mentioned and that is work some technologies to uh, perhaps fine tune our ear. And let's use this marathon time to say, what can we do? And um, and not be depressed about what we can't do. So I, I, what we wanna do is uh, put our heads together again as organizations for our membership and find out and bring experts to you all in a, in, that are listening uh, within the next month, bring experts to say now, how can we 
uh, face this and what is it that we can do. So our next webinar is going to be, what can we do? Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to gathering that because I'm as needy as anyone is on that. We're all very needy right now. But I, I do want to say uh, we shouldn't be without hope. We should go in the spirit of uh, there's there's things that we can be doing. Um, and uh, I love that. And I think it's going to be a, a, a good message for us. So we're, I'll just tell our attendees, look for it. Uh, we're going to post it. We'll tell you when it's going to be. We're going to increase the bandwidth so we can have 10,000 people join us <laughs> instead of 5,000 this time. Um, uh, and I also want to say, Alan, that we also want to uh, reiterate that we are going to edit this video, we are going to post it. Uh, people are wanting us to come up with a definitive statement, and we decided, no, we're going to bring you the experts and let you know what the science really is. That's what this was: it was a conversation, not a policy statement. So we're going to well, pull this together, edit it, include all the PowerPoint slides that Catherine and that uh, the doctors gave us today. We're going to make that available to everyone in the same source that we're going to show this video and allow you all to have this and uh, to work it out in this next stage that we're all entering in together. Yeah, it's very it's very easy for us just to kind of hear some some of this information and, and kind of get quiet or, or uh, go into uh, hibernation, if you will. Um, but that's not our job. Uh, and so we've heard a lot of that hope. And there's a lot of people out there that are actually doing some good things already. They're trying to create community still. They're trying to find ways to keep people engaged. It may not be in the highest artistic, as you said, but people are out there. And those are the, those are the examples we want to, to bring forth in our next webinar is how are you actually doing it out there? And share more of that so other people can benefit um, all around the world as we look at this interim strategy to when we get, actually get to that place again where we can uh, bring the joy of singing together back to back to reality. So um, I think we're ready to wrap this up. Uh, ready to wrap, wrap it up and any other further questions or anything like that? Can I just say one thing? You bet. Yeah, uh, Tim referred to the impact study. And one of the things it shows is that choruses are just powerhouses of community engagement and tolerance. And I think given to what can we do now, I'd urge you to think about how do you deploy that in your community to address some of the really horrific issues that have come up recently that are really brought into bright light about food, you know, food insecurity and and poverty and all those things uh, that I think choruses can actually be very usefully deployed in that way. You already have wonderful people singing with you. So it's just something I wanted to bring up. And we can talk more about in a month. <laughs> well, and it's not just the singers too, right? It's all the audience members out there. They, they're missing it too. And so how do you still keep in touch with all these people to give them hope and, and perhaps they actually give you hope in return? And I think that's really what we're really after because we know that those communities exist and have existed to do all this for so many, many years. So I think we... The very last thing I'll say, because I will have very angry staff members if I don't say some of the issues that were talked about today, we're going to drill down to uh, Chorus America's doing a virtual conference in June. So there'll be more opportunities and resources there as well for like slicing and dicing some of the things discussed today. Yeah. And uh, I think uh also nats is having a virtual conference at the end of june and we're going to be doing the same thing and yeah. dealing with uh, some of the contemporary issues that we faced uh adding new content to our conference that we hadn't envisioned a year ago when we planned the conference and yeah. so i think uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of content from all of our organizations uh, really there uh, as acts of service to our greater community um, and that's it's going to really be important for us to move together uh you know as unified as we can as a community uh we are already as we've discussed uh while the shutdown was rather quick and and unified the opening up that we're seeing of communities and states and uh and and municipalities is quite varied and will continue to be quite varied. And so there are gonna be multiple solutions that uh, all our constituency is going to have to uh, deal with and what, what is appropriate in one, one part of the country uh, may not be right yet in another part. And, and that's where 
we're going to rely on on those uh, who are informed through this webinar and other resources that we can provide uh, to to do exactly what Molly said and is bring clarity to uh, to the situations that we are in independently. Um, and Alan, we, I just want to say back to the doctor's report. People, I know that <laughs> I know that many of our members were taking notes and trying to find out every possible way they could still get in that room with each other. They they were <laughs> they were. They were envisioning this DreamWorks uh, choral rehearsal room with UV ceilings, with fans, with the exact kind of filtration systems. They had the spacing. They're probably right now in the room uh, getting what two meters looks like or one meter, whatever, uh, you know, six feet looks like. Uh, they're doing everything they can do because they, they missed this so badly. But I, I'm going to say, as a person that dealt with somebody that had to be in the hospital, you you don't want to you don't want to go to this you don't want to take this risk folks um you, you don't want to be facing uh oxygen tanks and and be responsible for somebody else that had to go to the hospital and and be there for a week so it's it's not it's not um it's not <laughs> a sacrifice that we really are, are are going to be able to uh uh overlook uh, that we should try to make make on for choral singing we we've got to um we've got to realize that we we need the marathon we need to live to fight another day so i want to encourage everyone to say that those aerosol points that we uh that we heard you were really hearing it that it's it's going to be almost impossible to avoid uh being in a room and breathing the same thing and we just don't want to do that to each other we we uh we live for beautiful things so let's let's take this other approach about how, what is it that we can do and let's use our time productively there until we get well until we get this vaccination and uh and let's look at it as dr as tom said and say wow what a tremendous growth period that was for the infrastructure for the health for the financial thinking for for the uh, administration of these ensembles that we do i think that's the better long-term approach for all of us and uh i certainly am a, a convert because i've been through this in a different sort of way and i don't want to i don't want to see anybody have to go through it Great, uh, great well insight. Well said. And I, I think, um, you know, we've we've talked around the private voice studio uh, situation, uh, and we've print plenty of data about that as well. But, um, you know, I think we've made it fairly clear that the same situation exists uh, in the one-on-one -on -one situation with the testing protocols that we would need. Um, the 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 types of netting and things and all that kind of screening material that is not going to work uh, and and those kinds of things uh, voice lessons outside maybe yes I've, I I have a couple of colleagues who are ready to set up their you know back deck studio uh, in the fall and things like that uh, and so you know we we might see some of that uh, and so we uh, you know we just I, I think one of the other things we all have to be aware of is especially those who are engaged in various institutions is to make sure that uh, we're at the table uh, and that the performing arts and the unique environments in which we teach and perform are, uh, are considered strongly in the overall institutional plans that are developed or reopening schools, reopening churches, uh, and and all of those things. We uh, we need to make sure that we're armed with as much data as we have. This webinar is, is hopefully one of those things you can be armed with, and the resources that are associated with it. Uh, and we will all do our best uh, as you, as you reach out to uh, to serve and provide the data that we can collectively, or lead you to resources that we know of. Uh, remember that we do have a handout associated with this session that you can download that has links to a, a variety of, of resources that you may uh, want to use. And we will then again, of course, make all the other things available. Uh, Lucinda or Dr. Milton, do you have, either of you have any final thoughts? Um, well, I, I think that all of the information and especially the things that all of you have brought up about using this time productively to 
strengthen your organizations and strengthen the community within your organizations is so important. Um, like I said, I, I have many artists who have figured out how to uh, perform. They find a little spot and set up their, their camera and, and they get virtual tips so that they can help support themselves. Um, I think that the most important thing for all of us is to realize that together, that all of us will be able to be successful in overcoming this pandemic and to allow us to grow not only you know as people but as a community and you know i'm looking forward to seeing all of the artistic expression that comes as this process as this marathon goes along and at the end of that so i i think that this has been a wonderful experience and i thank you all for inviting me to be part of this wonderful group. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, it, it's been a pleasure to be here and be able to share what uh, what I've been learning about this with you and, and uh, best of luck. I look forward to hearing some good music. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a great note to uh, end on. And we really want to appreciate all our panelists I'm so appreciative of my colleagues uh, at our sister organizations and their uh, leadership and their vision to bring us together and uh, have this conversation today. And we will look forward to uh, a time uh, in a month or so within a month that we can once again get together and try to provide and synthesize additional data that can be useful to us. So thank you so much for being with us and uh, we will talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks.